What's up everyone, this is Heiss, and we have yet another 10 levels of understanding video. This time we're going to be talking about air brakes on trains. Uh, this is quite the in-depth subject, and I figured it would be a great follow-up to our first 10 levels of understanding video. And talking about that video, many folks noted my brilliant artistic skills. I'm not the visual artist, I'm a railroader by trade, and I'm just trying to explain these topics to you guys the best I can, the back of the napkin that I have in front of me, which is my PC. If you guys know anyone who's into graphic design and would love to work for free on collaborating on something like this, by all means, maybe we can do a, a replacement series, but for now, this will get the concepts across. And I do want to preface this video with saying that, that this is going to be a 101 level. There are so many more in-depth things that we can get to with respect to air brakes, and I really want this video to be able to take someone who knows a very limited amount, if not anything about air brakes on trains and then be able to have a good understanding of how every piece of it will work. Maybe not to the crazy nitty gritty detail that some of us know, perhaps not to the level that experts who've rebuilt all these systems may actually know. So bear with me on this. What is level zero? Level zero is trains need to stop, but they take a long time to do that. Why is that? Well, I guess we'll learn the 10 levels to understand that, huh? So level one, very simple. We have a wheel over here in black. We have a brake shoe. We have a lever. And then we have a piston rod. If we stick a bunch of compressed air in here and press on this piston, it's going to push this rod, pivot this lever, and press this brake shoe against this wheel. And the resulting friction will slow the train down. There you go. Level one. <laughs> now, there's a couple little nuances to this. Why are we using compressed air? Why, why specifically do we go after air rather than steam or vacuum? So why not steam? If you have a pipe that runs all the way from the lead locomotive all the way down the train, and if you were to use steam to try and actuate your brakes, you're going to get condensation as you go away from the heat source. So the steam would turn into water. So that's no good, because we know that water and pistons don't like to play nicely from our previous video. So what about vacuum? Well, a lot of early systems and a lot of British historic systems do use vacuum, and I will admit that I don't know a heck of a lot about it, but I can tell you one thing, and it's the reason why we don't use vacuum in the States to this day, and it is that you can only ever get to vacuum. That is your minimum value, is no pressure. Whereas if you have air pressure, you can increase the pressure to varying different levels and get faster equipment response and better response all the way down the train. Because all the way down this, in order to be able to cut each of these cars out, we have to have seals and gaskets and a number of different things. And if we're trying to pull a vacuum through all those imperfect things, we have a hard time. Whereas if we can push air, we can push really high pressure air and uh, mitigate some of the losses as we go down. So we have a vague idea of why we use air as opposed to vacuum or steam. Well, how do we get that air? So on locomotives, we have what is called an air compressor. There are a number of different types. This is specifically a cross compound style air compressor. We have steam that comes in on the top side and presses a piston down, which presses a corresponding piston down, which starts to create air pressure from this air inlet. Because it is a compound pump, that air is then moved and recompressed in a second piston where we take the steam and we take the exhaust from the small cylinder, run it at lower pressure in the larger cylinder to get a similar force, press that piston down, recompress the air, and boom, our main reservoir air comes out and runs down the pipe. So this is a very simple explanation of a cross-compound air compressor. They're actually quite complex with a control valve located on top, which determines where the steam is going to go and how it's going to apply. And there's a lot of nuance to how you drain the condensate out of these compressors and how they're lubricated as well. But the point is, we get steam and we can press down to make air pressure. Now, one important thing to note here is that we are using steam to drive a piston to drive another piston that then creates the air pressure. 
which means that our air pressure is always less than our steam pressure unless we've had some massive loss of steam in the boiler after we've already created the air. We can only compress what we have. Typically, there's even a 20 PSI difference, whereas you need 150 PSI steam to make 130 PSI air. The air then comes out, goes through the radiator piping, and is stored in the main reservoirs, as we explained in the last video, where it can then be used for a number of different purposes, but today we are talking about those train brakes. So how do we get from level two, where we have main reservoirs, to level one, where we had that piston that needs to get pressed on? Enter level three, which is using straight air. So we have that main reservoir where our air is stored on the locomotive up here. Then we have a simple valve here that allows air to flow to the piston. If we turn the valve on, boom, we get airflow, we get brake pressure on the piston, Hooray, we now have brakes. This is the most simple variety that there is, and it was pretty much what the early train brakes were back in the day. This technology is still used for the independent brake as well, with a little bit more nuance between the controlling valve and the main reservoir, but the point is you just take pressure that you have and put it into a piston and apply the brakes. Now, why don't we use this in train brakes really anymore? Well, let's go back to our picture of the train here. So if we are taking air from our main reservoir on the locomotive, it's actually on the back of the tender with 20, but you get the idea. We have our main reservoir. We then pipe it to our control valve. And then from our control valve down a brake pipe that runs all the way down the train. And we are sending air air pressure directly from this reservoir down all the way. A, it's going to take a long time for that air pressure to get back to the rear. And it is also going to expend a lot of its pressure applying the brakes along the way. And most importantly, if for some reason we have a failure in the brake pipe in the first couple cars, you don't get brakes on the rest of those cars. If you have a separation, if you have a discontinuity anywhere in that brake pipe, you lose your pressure there, you're not able to apply brakes there. And if there's a way for the air to vent to atmosphere, it would rather do that than apply. Which is why you'll note that we have independent brakes just on the locomotive that are straight air, and now everything else is what we call automatic air, which is in level four. Level four, automatic air. What does that mean? Well, it means that in the event of a failure, the air automatically comes on. So that must mean it's like a semi-truck with the springs, right? No. This is one of the most common things I see on the Railroads Online Discord and folks trying to explain. Uh, and it's a little nuanced and kind of a neat thing with the way that it's set up and the way that it works. We have that same brake pipe running all the way through the train with the many hoses between the cars, all that fun stuff. Well, rather than sending positive pressure when we want to apply the brakes, what if we always sent pressure back at a fixed value? So say we like 90 PSI, because that's what a lot of people use. We send 90 PSI down the brake pipe. And what if we put little reservoirs on each car, like our main reservoir? So each car in the train gets its own little reservoir. So it can have its own little pocket of air. And now what if we put check valves between the reservoirs and the brake pipe so that we send the 90 PSI and we charge the reservoirs up to 90 PSI. And then if anything happens or changes to the brake pipe, the 90 PSI stays in the reservoir. We don't lose it. It doesn't go anywhere. That's what we call charging the train. Well, now what we could do is we could reduce the 90 PSI. We could reduce it to maybe 80 PSI. And now the pressure in the brake pipe in blue is less than the pressure in the reservoir that we've applied on each car. Well, what if we had a logic valve that compared the reservoir and the brake pipe pressure? And what if that logical valve could see the difference and say, hey, I need to send that much of a difference to the brake cylinder that we had before, which we used to apply directly, but now we're applying it indirectly. So now you have your brake cylinder in green after each of these comparison valves, as you make the reduction in pressure from 90 to 80 PSI, say, you see a 10 PSI difference in your orange control valve, 
and the control valve says, hey, reservoir, I need I need 10 PSI of your air to come in here to make me back to equilibrium. I, I want to see the same pressure in the reservoir and the brake pipe. So brake pipe slower. Guess what? I want 10 PSI of your air to now go into the brake cylinder, which means you get 10 PSI of braking force in that piston and then that presses onto the shoe onto the wheel so if we were to lose a connection at any of one of these hoses or have a failure in the brake pipe otherwise the brake pipe goes to zero which means all that 90 psi gets dumped out assuming that it had been charged up if you come to a consist of cars that has not had a locomotive on them for a while these are going to be at zero they bleed off over time the seals aren't perfect um, a lot of times you're supposed to bleed them off too, depending on operational situations. You have to hook in, hook your locomotive up to the front of the train, and start charging that brake pipe up. And depending on what kind of valves and reservoirs they have, it can take a long time to charge the train up too. But this is the basic principle of automatic air. The brakes are not sprung on. It is just a comparison between what the reservoir on the car has and what the brake pipe has. And as soon as you reduce that brake pipe pressure, the cylinders start to get an equivalent amount of pressure from the reservoir applied. And it's not exactly 10 PSI. If we have a 10 PSI difference, you don't get 10 PSI less in the cylinder just because we're talking about volumetric differences and that's not exactly how it works. But you get the idea. You lose brake pipe pressure you lose reservoir pressure because that is then going to the brake cylinders to apply the brakes. So let's do a quick recap because that was a lot really quick. The general principle of air brakes on a train is that we use air pressure in a piston cylinder arrangement to press on some links to press a brake shoe against a wheel. And then that friction slows us down. That's our level one. Level two is an understanding that we need to compress air to make that happen, and we have an air compressor built into the locomotive, of which there are many types, but they're all important and give us the necessary air we need to make sure that we can use the brakes. Level three is understanding the concept of straight air, where we basically take our main reservoir, run it through a valve, and then apply that directly to a piston and why that's bad when you run it along a train. And level four is understanding the basic principle of the first kind of automatic air brakes, where we have a brake pipe that runs down the train, individual reservoirs on each car, and then a comparison valve looks and sees any differences between those and will apply a reduction in brake pipe equivalent volume from the reservoir to the cylinder to slow down the train so that if we have any failures in the brake pipe we get a big set of air right away so what's level five well level five is understanding how the rigging actually applies the brake sets to the equipment so typically on a piece of railroad equipment in here we have the reservoir tied into the brake cylinder and then of course you could see the hoses on either side and the brake pipe runs all the way through the car to the reservoir. The cylinder can press outwards through a series of levers that then send force to the trucks. And on the trucks, you have a wheel set, a wheel set, and then typically you will have brakes on either the inside or the outside of the wheel sets. And this caboose has brakes on the outside. So you have brake shoes in yellow on the outside attached to a brake beam that runs from one side of the axle to the other with a lever up that allows the fulcrum and pivot to happen. And the force from the brake cylinder presses on the linkage and presses the shoes into the wheel. So on the truck, one of the levers is called the dead lever where it's pinned to the frame. And one of the levers is called the live lever and the live lever interfaces with the brake cylinder. And the dead lever is connected to what's called the slack adjuster which has a number of little holes in it to allow you to account for wear in both the wheels and in the brake shoes themselves to keep the brakes adjusted tight so that as things wear out, you're ensuring that you're not exhausting your piston stroke because if your piston runs all the way out, you don't actually get a brake set. You need your piston to stop before the end of the cylinder to ensure that you're actually imparting force upon the wheels. And so the dead lever is attached to the slack adjuster goes to the inside of the frame and then the two levers are tied together with the bottom rod and there's an associated lever with that uh, that is 
difficult to draw in 2D that causes the force to both squeeze in this way as we press on this lever. There's also inside hung brake rigging where the shoes are on the inside rather than on the outside, but this caboose in this drawing has them on the outside. There's also slightly different applications for locomotives where typically you'll have the brake rigging on one side of the wheel and you'll have tandem rods that run all the way down to a brake cylinder on one end that applies them all from the same way. And some diesel locomotives had what were called dual clasp brake rigging where you had both the inner and the outer shoes on the each individual wheel, which was a total pain, but most of those have been modified away to having the single clasp type like this. So how do we make those brake pipe reductions that we talked about in level four, where we can reduce the pressure from 90 to 80? How do we get there? Well, because of course there is, there's about a million different kinds of automatic air brake types out there, and they all change throughout history but many of them are quite similar, and we're going to talk about basically two different categories. And the first category is what we call non-self-lapping automatic air. And this is your early stuff. This is right after the straight air came out. We ended up with what is called A1 brake equipment, where we have a G6 automatic brake valve. Now, what does all of that stuff mean? That means that we have a five position valve to interface with the brakes for the train. Okay, well, what does that mean? It means that we have a release position, a running position, a lapped position, a service position, and an emergency position. Okay, well, what does that mean? Release is connecting the main reservoir to the brake pipe. So you take that big main reservoir pressure, 130 PSI, and just connect it straight into the brake pipe to recharge it really fast. Running. Running is attaching the main reservoir to the brake pipe through what's called a feed valve that guarantees we get back to our favorite set value. So 90 PSI. Your main reservoir is still typically, you know, something like 130, depends. So if you run in running position, you go, you take that 130, you go through a feed valve, you get your 90 PSI that you're then putting out to the brake pipe down here. If you leave the valve in release for a long time, you can get that 130 all the way through your brake pipe. And that's not brilliant because then you have no headroom to recharge it. You have to rely on the direct pressure and output of the air compressor to do that. Whereas if you have 130 and then you have 90, you've got a step where the air compressor isn't directly tied to the performance of the train. In other words, you're operating kind of dangerously if you were to be using the direct output, which is why we have this little step here. And then we have lap. Well, what does lap do? Lap holds whatever setting you have on the brake pipe. And that may be from you or it may be from the train. If you have a big leak back here somewhere, say that there's a valve slightly open or, or a bad seal, and you place the automatic into lap, your brake pipe pressure is gonna start to decrease because you're losing that pressure and lap says, hey, I'm not gonna change the pressure up here. I'm gonna leave it whatever it's set to. So what does that mean for non-self-lapping? Well, that means when we want to make a reduction as the engineer, we have to go to service and it decreases the brake pipe at a relatively constant rate. And then we move the handle back to lap and we've made our reduction. So if we wanna make our 10 PSI reduction in the brake pipe, we move the handle to service, it goes and then we move it back to lap. And when we can hold at 80, assuming that there's no leaks in any of this. And then when we want to release the brakes, we go back to release. So instead of just moving the handle further and further, we go to a dedicated position to reduce the brake pipe pressure and then come back and hold it. And what about emergency? Well, emergency, rather than slowly decreasing the brake pipe pressure, opens a big hole to the atmosphere. Hence why we call it the big hole, or emergency, or oh poop, or dynamiting the train. Your brake pipe pressure disappears very, very quickly when you get into this position. Now, so we said there are many types, and this is like the first bare bones type. Well, the most common on a lot of these steam engines, what was called 6ET, 
which was later than A1, and it basically added one more position, and it also increased the rate at which your brake pipe pressure decreases. And there's a bunch of different flavors of 6ET, but most steam locomotives had it. The additional feature is called engine hold, and it is past release, and it allows you to leave your set on your independent brake, because that's a separate valve, remember? This is just talking about the train. This allows you to hold whatever set you had on your independent without releasing it. So if you come only to this orange position, you release your uh, train, but you do not release your independent brake, which is important in some cases because in 6ET, when you apply the brakes in the service position, you'll also start to apply the independent brake valve, which means you'll typically bail it off i.e. hold it in release while you're making this application to keep the train stretched out. There were many other kinds of non-self-lapping brake valves. What, one that we've talked about previously on the channel is with the Union Pacific Big Boy and Train Simulator with 8ET, which is a more advanced version of 6ET that adds in the first service position, which gives you a minimum reduction when you start applying the brakes when you come in here. So rather than going all the way to service and waiting for a while to get your set gone, you can just kick the handle into first service and it'll take about a six PSI reduction on the train and then slowly increase that set from there, at which point you could then lap it and hold it. But the nice thing about that is that a lot of these brake valves on the cars don't do anything until you get about a five or six PSI reduction in there. So you could take a two pound, three pound set and it may not do anything, hence why they added first service, so you could guarantee that you'd get all the brake valves to set up on the cars, and as well, you could guarantee that you'd get that uniformly back all the way down a long train. Now let's take a look at an H6 automatic valve in 6ET, presently in release. And as we bring it to us, that is now running. Engine hold, which allows your independent to remain set up up there. And then we move it past the bump, and we get into lap, where it holds our set, and if we move it to the right, we get to service, back to lap hold, back to service, add more, and then we can release it by going back to running. And then here's the fun one, when you slam the valve all the way over to dynamite. So we talked about non-self-lapping in level six. What is self-lapping then? Well, this is your more modern style of air brake. The most common and is the basis for pretty much Every modern diesel locomotive at this point is 26L. Most diesel locomotives these days now have a computer-controlled air brake, but 26L is the all-pneumatic version that was the start, and it came around in the late 50s. And some steam engines do have it, or have been retrofitted to have 26L as well, but it's not terribly common in the steam world. So what do we have in 26L? Well, we have release all the way over. We have your first service kind of equivalent, minimum application when you start going on and then you have a constant gradient position where the further you move your handle this way the more brake you get set and it is what we call self-lapping where rather than going to that service position bringing the handle back to lap when we need to well no you can just push the handle there and that's how much brake you get you need a little more go a little bit further it's a lot more intuitive than having to go, okay, I need to come here, I need to watch a gauge, see what the pressure gets to, or hear what it gets to, and then go back to lap. Whereas this, I need a little more, well, I take a little more, take a little more, whatever you gotta do. You also have a suppression position coming up, also known as handle off, to recover from a lot of the diesel locomotive penalties and the penalty magnet valve. Uh, you have to go to this position, a number of different possibilities that could induce that. That's a whole other topic once again. And then again, everyone's favorite big hole. But the whole point of this is you move to a certain spot, you need more brake, you move the handle further. You move it further, you move it further. It's a lot easier to understand than the old brake styles where you need to run back and forth between the positions. Hence why it's a new level, level 7. Before we move on, let's take a look at this quick clip of me with 26L. As I grab the automatic handle and I bring it towards me, the pressure decreased as you can see the white needle going down, and it continues to do so until I stop moving the handle. And when I stop, I leave the handle right where it was and I maintain that set. Okay, so what is level 8 then? Well, we've spent a lot of time just talking about the control valves on the locomotives. So why don't we talk about the valves on the cars? There's a lot of different flavors of control valve on each of the cars. 
Some of the early stuff were called K-triple valves or F-type valves on some of these Rio Grande passenger cars. And they're very simple comparisons of, okay, what does this guy say? What does this guy say? But as the cars got more modern, more and more safety features have been put on them with AB-type valves, ABWX-type valves, uh, etc. There's a bunch of different flavors of them. But basically, rather than just being a comparison, the more modern valves also look at the flow rate. And they see, okay, well, how fast is the brake pipe pressure decreasing? If it's decreasing at that emergency service rate, these valves are now smart enough to go, oh, I need to instantly dump everything I've got right here. I'm seeing the pressure disappear very quickly. I need to dump all of my brake reservoir pressure into the brake cylinder right here, right now. And then they're smart enough to hold it open like that for quite some time, which makes operations challenging when you have a mix of older equipment and not. In a, a recent DRL Valley episode, I told a story about how I had accidentally put the train into an emergency service application because uh, I wasn't expecting the automatic to move as easy as it did because somebody had lubricated it in the middle of the day and not said it anything. And I was able to go back to uh, release to get the brake pipe right back where it was. And it was a brief stutter, but that was it. If you get that emergency reduction rate at all with these more modern type valves, you're you're done. You're hosed. You are stopping. That that is the whole point of them. They're a safety critical thing. Where okay, we saw that fast reduction. Whether or not you meant to do it or not, you're going to stop. That is the whole point. So there's a number of different flavors of those valves, and some of them have then requirements that say, okay, well, I'm going to leave it dumped for five minutes and you're not going to be able to recover the air of the train for five minutes. And then you start recharging. And these valves that have uh, typically like the ABs have extra reservoirs for extra service functions. So they take even longer to charge. So you, you wait for five minutes to let the thing recover, uh, you know, to even be able to try and send pressure back down the brake pipe again and then you have to wait even longer for them to charge so they can uh, they can be quite the challenge because you know when you're talking about running trains with 100 cars long you don't know where the failure is you want to make sure that everything stays dynamited for long enough for you to inspect and see what the problem was and that that's a really brief look at a level eight the fact that there are different comparison valves control valves on the cars i don't know near enough about this level myself learning air brakes in general and cars and the technologies behind them is something that you could do as a lifelong journey and not know at all so uh, that's something that i hope to learn more about in the future but uh, if you guys know a little bit more about some of this end of things, I'd love to hear it in the comments as always. It's great to get to interact with everybody and find some folks who have a different level of understanding than even I do and uh, be able to understand some of these things together. It's, it's really cool to have that conversation. So uh, if you're a Carmen or you know air brakes better than me, by all means, let's, uh, let's get together and chat. What is level nine? Level nine is talking about something that we all know and love in the steam world, and that is double heading. What do we do when we have two engines and we have two brake stands? Who's got the control? How does that work? Well, in the ancient days, you'd have to have someone cut their brake stand out. In this case, this picture, we have the RGS 20 and the DNR GW 463 masquerading as the RGS 455 for a photo charter that we were part of on the Cumbrace and Toltec with this freight train. It was a lot of fun. Some of the best times of my life so far. Um, and we have 20s air compressor and 463s air compressor, right? And they're both supplying air to their own main reservoirs, 463 on the side, 20 on the rear of its tender. But with 20 in the lead, only 20's main reservoir on the tender, it's actually up here, it's not even on the back. It shows you how much railroads on light have been playing. You can see the, the pipe that runs up to it right there. Uh, only 20's main reservoir ends up applying any f amount of pressure to the brake pipe through 20's automatic valve. So you have the air compressor up here. It supplies air to the main reservoir. The main reservoir then feeds back to the cab where the, in the case of 20, A1 equipment, G6 automatic valve, where through that feed valve and whatever the automatic valve is set to in the cab, you then get that brake pipe pressure running down the train. 
and 463 has its cut out. So rather than having its valve having control and doing things to the brake pipe, we just run straight through it and it acts like it's a train car. It doesn't even act like it's a locomotive, which made it really interesting because 20 has a single 11 inch air compressor. And so 20 was recharging the whole train all by itself. 463 has a cross compound, bigger air compressor, able to make more air. But no, 20's pump just got to work for the money. <laughs> got to got to earn its keep and resupply the brake pipe for us. And 463's wasn't able to do anything because the automatic brake stand had to be cut out in the 463. And this leads you to an interesting practice and whistle signal on the Rio Grande. If you were changing double heading to not double heading, they actually had uh, dedicated signals to say, hey, I'm handing you control of the air brakes cut your air stand in or hey i'm giving up control you know or passing the air forwards or backwards there's a dedicated signal to say hey you're getting control of the air or hey you're getting control of the air and they actually have a dedicated whistle signal on the rio grande to say hey i'm handing you the air and it was two shorts and a long so if you're handing it back you'd blow two shorts long whistle you say hey i'm handing you the air you're in control you're the lead engine now and then the second engine would respond with the same whistle signal back. Now, if the second engine just had a, another locomotive put on top of it and is giving up control, he would blow a short, a long, and then a short, telling the lead engine, hey, you have control of the brakes now. Make sure you cut yours in. And then the lead engine would correspond with the same whistle signal as an acknowledgement that, yes, I've cut my stand in. I'm in control. Now let's take a look and see how this is different for diesel locomotives. So here we have a picture of this sad uh, X Great Northern ST9 that sat in the deadline for a long time at my shop at BNSF. But anyways, you can see that we don't just have a brake pipe hose. We have a number of different hoses off the end of the locomotive. And this allows for much better control. And it solves the problem that I was talking about with with the 20 and the 463 where only one air compressor was supplying anything to the train line you have the brake pipe hose but you also have three mu hoses and they're the same on either side you only technically need to lace up one side though the rule book does say sometimes you need to set up both of which there are the main reservoir hose the brake cylinder hose and then the independent actuating and release hose so what does that mean that means that your main reservoirs are all tied together so you can get the air compressor from each locomotive in your consist to be supplying to one larger reservoir to ensure you don't run out of air which is a really good feature you also have the brake cylinder hose that ensures whatever selection the engineers made with his independent brake runs through here and you also have the actuating and release hose which allows the engineer to bail off when no matter what the brake pipe is doing throughout his whole consist he can ensure all of his locomotives will release and or apply depending on what he's doing and the reason for this separate actuating and release hose is because with 26L air brakes, you've gotten so advanced in the terms of the number of valves that rather than just having the couple valves in the cab on a steam engine and a distributing valve underneath the cab floor, you've got a ton of air work underneath the engineer's side of the cab with a bunch of different valves and it takes into account everything from the way that the brake shoes are set up and what, what brake cylinder pressure the locomotive needs to operate with to what kind of valves it has in the cab and so they all have a different effect so each locomotive may have a different brake shoe setup so it needs to get a different brake cylinder pressure so you can't just send a raw this is how much you have. You send a, a signal that says, hey, you need to apply the brakes to this amount. And it may be 45 PSI on one kind of brake rigging. It might be 72 on another kind. And that way the consist can all give their maximum braking based on what their own brake shoe setup is. On diesel locomotives, you also have the MU cable and MU pot that sends electrical signals for what the loading and reverser positions and headlights and everything need to do. But that's, again, a whole nother topic. We're just trying to talk about air brakes this go around. So we'll, uh, we'll broach that for another video, perhaps, if folks are interested. So what about level 10? What else could we talk about with respect to air brakes on trains? Well, I figured I would toot my own horn and talk about the things that I work on 
day in and day out, and that is positive train control. Now, positive train control, or PTC, was mandated by the FRA following a number of different safety-related incidents starting 2008, and was required of all railroads to install depending on a bunch of different factors, you know, how, if you're hauling passengers, if you're hauling hazmat, how much cargo you're hauling, how fast the trains are running, etc. But barring the politics of it and how we got there and why we have PTC, I wanted to talk about how PTC actually runs the brakes a little bit. And I can't get into super crazy detail because there's NDAs and all that fun stuff, but I could talk about the two basic kind of things. And first is for older style locomotives like this SD9 that well, this SD9 doesn't even have 26L. It's got an older version of air brake that we didn't even talk about. I'm pretty sure it's got 24, but I don't know enough about 24 to speak intelligently to it. So I'll uh, pretend that it has 26L for the sake of argument. And what PTC has is it has two magnet valves. And what's a magnet valve? Magnet valve is a valve that you can open with an electrical signal. So you apply an electrical current to it and it opens the valve and it does whatever it needs to do. And what PTC can then do is one of them is a penalty magnet valve that will put a penalty application on the brakes. So slow you down until the penalty can be removed, at which point you can recover the air and keep going. And that is at a gentle application rate if things are not acknowledged by the engineer. And then you have an emergency magnet valve, which is, you know, an emergency big hole. It dumps all the way open and that's if something rapidly changes in front of the train for whatever reason but how does it work on the more modern stuff with the more advanced braking systems well the most modern locomotives basically have 26l but it's computer controlled and they even have like a fully functional version of 26l within them where if for whatever reason the computer breaks you have what's called the pneumatic backup mode where you can continue to operate the air brakes in 26l you know, original pneumatic only mode, pretty much. But rather than having those magnet valves, PTC can just directly talk to the computers in the air brake and then apply the brakes as it needs to, however it needs to, in, in a more defined way than just giving you, okay, well, this application because I can only control one valve. It can control the automatic and it can control the independent and do everything it needs to do. That's why PTC is the most advanced with the locomotives that have electronic air brakes, even though that at the core of the system, the electronic air brakes are really just the 26L that we've had since 1957. But the reason behind that electronic air brake is because with a computer monitoring it, the FRA has allowed for railroads to go longer in between maintenance schedules. So previously, if you had just pneumatic air brakes, you had to do maintenance on these locomotives every 92 service days. So you'd call it an M92. You'd have to go through and requalify the air. But now with the computer control, they're allowing 184 days. So it's about a half a year semi-annual requirement to bring the locomotive in for maintenance. And so if things are operating without failure, they could potentially be out of the shop for half a year at a time. Whereas back in the days of steam, well, you're, you're in the shop at least once every 30 days, if not more. So you could start to understand why we have diesel locomotives instead. Okay, that was once again a whole giant pile of stuff. And, and this one was a little bit harder to get reference for and get pictures for. So apologies on that front, but let, let's do a quick recap of what we've got going here. So level one, we have compressed air. We press a piston, piston presses linkage, presses a brake shoe against a wheel, we get friction, we slow down. Level two, we need air to come from somewhere. So we have an air compressor on our locomotive that compresses the air. Uh, in steam locomotives, it's obviously steam driven. Diesel locomotives have basically the modern equivalent of a screw compressor like at your shop has. And then that fills a main reservoir with air. Level three, we can take that main reservoir pressure and basically dump it into the brake cylinders all the way down the train to give us train brakes and independent brakes. But we realized that if there was any failures, things would not go well and we needed to have a better backup system. So we have level four where we have a brake pipe and dedicated reservoir in each car. And these reservoirs could then be charged up with air. And we could take a comparison between the brake pipe and the reservoir to figure out what we need to do with the brake cylinder to actually get a good application of the brakes. Level five, we have brake rigging. 
there are many different flavors of brake rigging, but we need to understand how we can translate that brake cylinder force to the wheels, and we need to ensure that we can then adjust it as things wear out. Level six, many different types of air brakes, because of course there are. 6ET, 26L being two of the most prevalent, but we talked about plenty. 6ET being non-self-lapping, which was our level six, and 26L being self-lapping, which was our level seven. Level eight, there's different kinds of brake valves on our cars within our train of a number of different types in order to provide additional safety and provide additional functionality and monitoring for when an emergency application occurs. Level nine, we have double heading where we have to be able to cut out the brake stand in one of our locomotives and we only supply air from one of our steam locomotives but if we're in the modern day diesel era we don't have to worry about that because we have dedicated mu hoses with abilities to connect our main reservoir brake cylinders and independent actuating and release together and last but not least level 10 we have positive train control that can then apply the brakes to our train to ensure that there are mitigations in the event that the engineer misses something or something changes in front of him so again this was just getting your toes into the swimming pool on air brakes i know less about air brakes than i do about all of the things steam locomotive but this should give you a good rough overview of hey this is how brakes on trains work and it gets so much more detailed. There are so many more different kinds of air brakes we didn't even talk about. We didn't talk about leak maintaining. We didn't talk about all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and it's incredibly interesting stuff. So uh, by all means, I'd love to have the further conversation with you all. So if you guys have air brake knowledge that you thought I missed or would like to talk about or fun facts, or if you are a British vacuum brake expert, by all means, let's link up and let's talk about that stuff perhaps in a future video i hope you like this video guys make sure you like the video if you did subscribe to the channel we're going to be talking more about the details of how railroads and trains work and continue enjoying the video games along the way as well so make sure you subscribe to the channel click the bell for all the notifications and we'll catch you next time thank you so much for watching